its data. Okay, but before, have you ever, you were not there when I gave him the Wilson class when I talked about the Goody theory, right? Um, I only made it to one of those courses. One of them, yeah. So, I mean, earlier, in your earlier life, did you ever hear about the critical theory of religion? Or the critical theory of society? Or the Frankfurt School? Ever? Uh, well, I guess my sister kind of introduced it. Yeah. Um, quite a few years ago. Yeah. And I didn't, didn't really... Uh, but it was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we are all new to it, except Dustin, of course. And so that's how we want to start, right? Now, according to the Humboldt reform, I can come 15 minutes late. <laughs> according <laughs> to the Humboldt reform, they, they took it over here in the States, and oh. that is the PhD was introduced, and what the seminar was introduced, and the cum center, cum, 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 what is it? Cum tempora, cum tempora, ah, tempora. means 15 minutes. They come 15 minutes late. It's my privilege. Okay. Do you all have something to drink? Do you all have something to eat? Very good. Okay, let's start today. Is it warm enough? Is it cold enough? Mm -hmm. Do you feel well tempered? Okay. Let me just start out with this thing here. Um, I think Alex knows it already, but we just brought out three books and there's a fourth one coming. I just want to tell you that our discourse here is embedded in a broader one, worldwide one, right? So um, they were mediated here by, uh, by St. Petersburg University and they were printed in New Delhi and we write a, in a book there for Iran or so. So it's a worldwide type of arrangement so that we get out of the smallness, right? So the university doesn't want to be just a local university. They want to be international. So, and we are taking that seriously. So I let this go through. Then we had also, we have something uh, in France. So, terror et sacralité, that means the terror and sacrality and the sacred, terror and the sacred. And here Mike Art, whom you saw in the movie, he has something in there. I have something in there. Dustin, you didn't, not you were not with us at that time. So, here you can see, so it reaches, you know, from Iran to Paris to Germany um, to over here to Canada. And uh, so I let that go through too here to you. Here there is my article about uh, inverse theology against clerical fascism. That was a wonderful, wonderful thing there. So, and then of course we have Yalta and we have uh, um, Dubrovnik, right? Where we one is 37 years old, the other one is, I think, 10 years old, 11 years old. See, so we have, uh, you know, we are worldwide spread. Uh, the, um, what we want to concentrate on, as far as authors are concerned, is that this Axel Honneth thing. Did you look around if there's some translation? There are some. Yeah, Did you I order some? I ordered them for you, yeah. Okay, so we will order them, uh, at least for me there. But look it up, Google it or whatever. This is his name, Axel Honneth, H-O-N-N-E-T-H. So uh, that uh, that's where the name comes from, the, um, the, the sickness of reason, the pathology of reason. So that is the honest guy. And he is the student of another one, and we can take him into consideration too. That is Habermas. So there are a lot of people. So we have to concentrate a little bit, right? So we cannot take them all. Um, we have uh, co-authored an article for a Harvard Journal on critical theory, and there are 15 critical theorists uh, there and, you know, uh, cooperate with us there. So there's a large amount of people, particularly in the Ivy League colleges in Harvard or Yale or whatever. So um, they are too expensive for Western, so we don't get them usually. Okay, so that is, that's Habermas here too, so that's how it is spelled, H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S. He's still alive, and the other one too. Um, the, uh, he's a generation older, so he is the first generation of the critical theorists, and this uh, fellow here uh, the uh, hundred is the second, third generation, third generation. So, and the fourth generation that would be you. So here are few. Unfortunately, it is the wrong language. But here, let me see. Is there one? Axel Hannes. No, it's also German. Critique of power. And there he cooperates together with uh, um, with another type of deconstructionist. It's another uh, movement. So. When you think, you know, about Hegel is the core 
some of that was the great scholar of modernity, H-E-G-E-L, and then his school split, so you have a Hegelian right, Hegelian left, Hegelian center, and on the Hegelian right you have the neoconservatives and uh, the neoliberals and, on, and from court, the whole tradition, so our departments on, in Western are all on the right, they are positivistic departments, but then in some departments you have these deconstructionists, but uh, they are also on the right. So Karl Schmitt was the great Jewist of Hitler, and he is the father of both deconstructionists and neoconservatives. So, and then you have on the left, then they would have Habermas and uh, this Hannes and so on. They would be on the left. Okay, again in right, again in center, again in left, so that we locate where we are. Um, definitely the critical theory belongs to the left. It's called the action philosophy. Um, so, and then we have the center. In the center, you have uh, people like Hans Küng in Germany. Um, you have uh, other historian in in uh, London. There was he's dead in the meantime, but a famous historian there was. He comes to me later. So he would be the Hegelian left. They are closest to Hegel. The others, the right and the left, they are critical, but of Hegel, but they are still using his method or rejecting his method. So. The left is dialectical, the right is positivistic. That's why we don't know anything about dialectics here, because the whole thing is on the right. But we have to, you know, say some things about dialectics, because on the left they have a mouse and they are all dialecticians. Okay, so that is um, it now. As far as the syllabus is concerned, we started out already the last time. I printed some out, but I was not lucky in uh, putting them together. So. They are somehow, we have to be careful, there are little uh, treacherous things here in the back. Who doesn't have a syllabus yet? Okay, then maybe you can take that out again, or you know, that you don't hurt yourself. Be careful, it's sticking out there. Okay, okay. and who else doesn't have a syllabus yet? You have a, you yeah. have a syllabus? Dustin, you have one? Is it the same one you gave last week? That yeah. looks a little bigger. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that one looks much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. how did like it get bigger? I don't know how it got bigger. It ate its schnitzel. Yeah, it ate too much. <laughs> what was it? Or did you put two of them together? Yeah, they are, they are two together. That's how it got bigger. Okay, so we can, you can divide it. That must be bigger too there. Yeah. We cannot get it apart anymore. I, so I don't think David's, David's coming tonight, right? Something yeah. Different. And I don't think he has one, so maybe he we can Okay, so maybe we don't give one to him. Don't need it, okay. Okay, so... He has one? I don't think so. Oh. Yeah. Okay. He can take it apart. Yeah. He can use some of his machines. He's a strong guy. <laughs> He's a hockey player. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, um, as far as this thing there is concerned, uh, we have two movies there. On one is Sticko for more. The other one is on McGovern. I mentioned him already. I was his campaign manager. And so we can look at the one or the other. Um, but what is important for us is I have your grade, so everybody gets a grade, everybody has wonderful grades already. If you were in the religion department, I would promise you heaven, but this is a secular department, <laughs> so I don't know where you will go. Um, then another thing here, I mentioned Dubrovnik a lot. This is the announcement for this year's Dubrovnik course. So um, that is uh, almost an international university in Dubrovnik. These are all the courses here. <coughs> There you can see what the world is discussing outside of Kalamazoo. And there you have down here, the, where is our thing there, it's the 27th, yeah, here, it's uh, the 22nd to 27th of April, Future of Religion. It is the 37th time that we meet. So we didn't meet, miss one class, even during five years of civil war. We went there and they shot at us. So this is a Future of Religion, Remembrance, liberation, solidarity. So <coughs> the wonderful thing is that scholars are coming there. You don't have to go to Paris or whatever. You can meet them there and have nice discussions, wine drinking, and so on. So you can just look at this thing there. <coughs> okay, and we have each time when we have a session here, everybody gets an A afterwards, and that will accumulate, and that will make you happy. So here is my. Here is my thing there. It is in the exam week? Or? I think so. Oh, that's unfortunate. There will be no exams then. Okay.
Okay, here are the... Um, does everybody have this uh, road map then? Did you have part of it the last time? I, I have I the rest of it. I went to the site and under road map it had just a fourth page. Maybe I looked at the wrong part. Oh. But, but, but this is, uh, belongs to it. So I gave you only half of it the last time. So just put that in the back then. Okay. And I think the same thing is true for you, right? Mm -hmm. So I have printed out one for you, and then you just uh, get it together, the other two. And that is mine here. And then I have another one. Do you have one, Dustin? Uh, so uh, do you have a uh, road map? I can bring it with me. Uh, no, you can have this there. Okay. So I have how, many how many pages is that one? Uh, well, I can count it there. Well, that is a whole one. This is the whole one. Yeah, that's the whole but one. Yeah, well, I part still one. have a part one, partial one. So you have the part now to the second part, right? Okay. So then we can give that to to David there too. Okay. So um, just one, one thing after the other. Um, and we looked at the books. Um, here we have this. And now we want to go forward a little bit systematic. We had one session the last time, and that was called History and Structure of the Consequences of the Critical Theory of Society, Habermas and Hunneth, with um, emphasis on the uh, pathology of reason. That is our theme here, which we don't want to forget, so we introduced ourselves and so on, so we come to the second discourse today, and that means central notions and uh, problems, um, mutual understanding, and the struggle for recognition as sources for the uh, pathology of reason and also for um, possibility of therapy. So that is our theme. Now the syllabus, uh, let, let's go through it very shortly. And uh, so also please read it. Uh, first of all, there is um, a course description. And there are some quotations there, which are very from Nietzsche and others. So course description is our textbook. We don't have a textbook. There are no textbooks. So that is our textbook. And please read this as at your leisure. Slowly, you don't have to read it all through there first. You can. We will always refer to that. We have themes, and the themes are all taken from this. You see the under B, main discourse themes on page 30. And um, there we have this whole uh, course description is somewhat present in these questions there. So um, course description, you can see there are certain subtitles, and um, we can just mention a few of them. Uh, central notions and problems, that's what we have there as our discourse theme then. And we will look at this uh, later on, and so or we can do it right away. Um, then you have political ideals there, mm, that means particularly Habermas and then also Hannes, they grew up in Germany, Habermas got the fascism first, then over to liberalism, then he suddenly found uh, Horkheimer and Adorno. By the way, I have uh, pictures of them, somebody gave me pictures, maybe I'll find it later on, let me look them up. So, um, okay, so that would be, we don't have to go through this now. Um, we can do that later. Main discourse themes under B, so one, two, we are in the second one today. So we just want to follow that, but we are not bound to this. So we can uh, move on our own wherever the Spirit leads us to. Um, then after that we have, uh, so there are much more questions and uh, themes than we can ever deal with, but it should just guide us. C is background reading. So now, I suggest that um, we have one background reading, and that would be that, that these are the three volumes of my manifesto, which came out in 2010. Each of you three, Dustin knows it already anyway, each of you three can take one volume home, and that would be your depth study. That means, uh, not the depth study, the background reading. And you just start reading there, right, wherever you get there. So. Uh, that you keep, you can keep it through the whole semester then. And um, uh, two chapters, you know, which are stories in there. 
So some chapters of story, there's a story about uh, religion under socialism, uh, something on socialism, religion under liberalism. Uh, so the liberals has had two chapters, New York, the center of uh, liberalism and so on. So uh, if you can find a chapter, you know, where there's a story in it, that's easier to read. So, But just start out um, at the end of the first volume, you will see there's a lot about here. Dieter Hennige, who helped out, to supported us, and so on and so on. So, uh, and um, Dustin is in a lot of people who have cooperated. You know, like everything, you do it in community with other people, and so that is a community work. So uh, we can simply, Alex, you can take whoever wants to take what. So, um, but let's distribute this so that each of you has one who is smallest of you. He gets a <laughs> smaller one, and Alex gets a bigger one. Yeah, Alex, this is yours. Okay. So just preserve it nicely, right? They cost $400 uh, together. So that is a precious thing there, and we want to keep it for a while. There is one in the university library, too, but you don't need more than this, okay? So, and then we can cooperate. Everybody, you know, starts from another perspective, okay? So that would be the background reading. So we can ignore that here, what we have here, these books there. Um, and uh, then we have a depth study. That we don't want to ignore. The depth study means to choose, that's under D, page 34. There we want to choose, uh, you know, one of the critical theories. Now, there is Hannes there and there's Habermas. So the best thing would be to concentrate on them. But whatever else you want to do, uh, if you want to take somebody else, that's okay as well, right? So, um, we have the A.H. Form, who comes very close to that. He talks about staying and in civil society. But then on page 38, you have Jürgen Habermas. So that would be a good field of, uh, of uh, concentration. And many of these books have been translated. So they are in English. And you can get them from the library. And then there's Axel Hannes, number 9 there on page 39. So I think it would be good. We have to limit ourselves somehow. So let's concentrate on those two critical theories and then, you know, think about them. And we can do uh, introduce you to them right away. And then there are other recommended, you know, uh, things, but, uh, and you can look them through and see if you find something interesting. There are close alliances, you know, the critical theory, and there are counter theories too, of course. Yeah, we don't, there is only one, so we have structural functionalism, we have behaviorism, and so So there are a lot of, uh, other theories around as well. And then there's books and music there, uh, which is related to the critical theory. Mm -hmm. Victor Hugo, for instance, would be a wonderful connection. Then Bertolt Brecht and Kafka is very important. A lot of Brecht books, then Kafka books, Baudelaire plays a great role, and even Keller, and then Adorno and Beckett, and there are two books by Beckett and so on. So if you want to sometimes relax, and how relaxing it is, but uh, relax and take some poetry or some uh, novel or something like that, which would be, they are all related to the critical theory there, so you have that too. And then we have the tests. So the tests, uh, <coughs> first of all, we are here 600 levels old, we have a take-home test. On a 300 level, I always have to do it in class. So um, what we can do is, you can write, um, you know, a little essay on uh, the on on whatever you have chosen from Habermas or from uh, from the other one. Uh, um, I can also do that that I do that we do a double thing. I can uh, set up a few questions. Uh, I can make a test with two questions, and then you have a choice either to answer those questions or to write a little essay on one of the guys you have chosen, whom you have chosen, uh, or about this there, whatever you have read. So if you have made 10 pages in or 20 pages, then you could take that in the test and write about it. So we can think about what you would like to do. So one thing would be to write an essay on your background reading. These are the three volumes or on the depth study, whatever you have chosen, that is one possibility. 
we could also do, you know, to uh, half, uh, divide it in half, and half of the essay would be about your background reading, the other one about Habermas or Arnold, whatever you have chosen. So, And the third possibility would be, too, that I put up some questions. Uh, let's see, 30 questions, and you would answer six of them. But maybe for our seminar, we have to think about it whatever you feel most comfortable. So we would do that three times. <coughs> the first week of uh, February, first week of uh, March, first week or second week or whatever of April. Okay, so that would be the whole thing as far as tests are concerned. No quizzes or whatever. Um, we can have lectures as much as you want to, but the more discussions we have, the better it is. So. Uh, I'm glad to lecture, and then you can break in and can say, wait a minute, I don't believe a thing, then we can start our discourse, right? So we want to do that in a very relaxed way. <coughs> okay, so tests, and then what else is there? There are objectives which we want to reach, um, and then there is grading. So your final grade will be, con be consist of three grades for the test then, and then a grade for every meeting which we have here. And these two things we will count together then. As, I, as my, uh, Alex knows, I'm against this mathematical stuff there because we come from, uh, particularly in these 300 classes there, um, we come from different cultures, you know, even if somebody comes from Upper Michigan and the other one comes from Detroit or whatever, it's not fair, you know, to judge people or if some people, um, you know, have to work all day long and, and others, you know, have the luxury to study all day long or whatever. So we have to, the mathematics would be, uh, you know, would be correct, but it would be entirely untrue. We'll see that there's a great difference between the two things. You can make a lot of correct statements about something, but they're all untrue. So um, therefore we, you know, take ourselves and our lives and turn into consideration. So that is, I think there is something maybe about academic honesty. I think I have left it out because it's so superfluous. So, um, okay, so that is our, uh, um, our thing here. So look it through and make your choices. Okay, any question about this thing there? I have a question. Huh? Yes. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned some discourse during um, Colonial Kitchen. On Saturday? Yeah. What, mm -hmm. what is that? Then you, you get part of your tuition back. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, Every Saturday, we yeah. go to Colonial Kitchen over on Drake at 1230. And month. you get a free lunch. <laughs> yeah. And there's graduate students, you know, master's students, PhD students. Sometimes older people come along to their stay with the job creator. <laughs> he created a job for you once, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A couple of summers yeah, I worked for. And uh, so sometimes older alumni are coming in, uh, older faculty come in sometimes too, and crazy sometimes, yeah, right. Sometimes there are many, sometimes there are few. <laughs> Depends how hungry they are. When they are hungry, they all come. If they are not hungry, then they stay away. Okay, but you always invite us. Tell me before, so that we know, you know, a little bit what, uh, how many will be there. Okay. They have a room for us there, so we have a room for twenty or thirty people. Uh, Okay. okay. Um, now there is. Um, I don't think we will do that. Um, what we used to will start out every time is a time diagnosis. Um, that means we take some event or what is just discussed in public, like gun control. Now the whole nation is upset and crazy and uh, about this gun thing, but it shows us something. You know, which we want to see what the critical theory has to say to those things, or these horrible killings, you know, these 20 kindergarten people and before that in the theater and before that somewhere else and so why that happens regularly and why 33 people are killed every day, 33 Americans are murdered every day, and why we have this horrible killing in Chicago, there were just 500 last year now, already a few in the first weeks of the new year and so on. So and it's even predictable that so people make predictions at the end of the Obama administration in four years, so many people, Americans will have been murdered and, and so on. So what is behind that? You know, it can be applied, 
categories, psychoanalytical categories, you know, historical materialist categories, um, and can they help us to make sense of that what appears to us, uh, what is before us? Can we get to the bottom of these things? Because that was the motivation of the critical theory from the very beginning. It started um, with the First World War, and these people, Eric Fromm was in Frankfurt, Adorno was in Frankfurt, Hockheimer was in Stuttgart, and they were in the draft age somehow, um, and so they were all enthusiastic. Uh, you know, they were Jews, but they felt German. The horrible thing what was done to all these people is that they were told someday that they are not Germans. I mean, they were all with the German football games, you know, when the Germans fought in Paris, they all shouted and screamed for the Germans. And I mean, they felt totally German, and then suddenly they were told because of the DNA, which wasn't there yet, but they had their own genome, and therefore they were not Germans. And so, but they were very interested. But then, of course, when the casualty list came, you know, from East and the West, and then they were became sober, and uh, then they asked, you know, what, why people, in the end, 10 million people were dead, uh, why they were all killing each other. And so they looked to great thinkers before who could help them, and one great thinker was Arthur Schopenhauer, for instance. Another one was then Hegel, whom they discovered. Another one was Marx, and another one was Freud. So these are the main things. We could have a uh, very shortly. Can we deal with that thing there? Can we put something in? Do you know how to do that? Yes. Um, oh, maybe, put maybe we can. Just a few minutes, maybe. Um, the, uh, we saw one movie the last time, right? So let's have a few minutes of this one here. Um, where I have a conversation about about the critical theory and some aspects of it. Maybe we do it 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 5, 15 minutes or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Alex knows, already knows the thing. We've showed it in the other class. Uh, so Alex can meditate in the meantime. Um, we did that here in this room and we plan to do another one of that, so we want to have a whole series, but it's a money question. The question is where we get the money from. So we have to find some capitalists who have a bad conscience <laughs> and who could uh, give us some money. By the way, this is uh, true. I mean, Marx had Engels, you know, who was a capitalist, and uh, the Frankfurt School people had Weil, but Weil was a businessman uh, from Argentine who brought food to the Germans uh, across the ocean to, during the war and he made a horrendous amount of money and then he wanted to have a doctorate and um, he said, um, you know, I give you money for the institute, do you give me a doctorate? So that is how the institute was built then in, in Frankfurt and you will see there is a picture there of it. So maybe it's good, it is more specific, the critical theory of religion, we are not concerned only with that. We are concerned with the critical theory of society and we have developed the critical theory of religion out of the critical theory of society. So so you can see a little bit there. Maybe we just want to see what it says about three things, uh, about um, Marx and Freud, and then we, we cut it. And maybe the theodicy problem. Welcome to the first in a series of introspective conversations on the it? critical theory of religion. Yeah. With Professor Rudolph J. Sievers. Is it loud enough? Professor Sievers is an esteemed senior member of the sociology the of the of Christian Protestant at Western Michigan. Uh, was the main man who did this the movie. movie of the critical theory of religion in the United See, States. That's here. Known the internationally morning. for his views on the critical theories and their importance to the worldwide future of peace and understanding. Professor Siebert is the founder of the Center of Humanistic Future Studies at Western Michigan University and of two annual international conferences in Dubrovnik and Yalta for the Inter-University Center for Postgraduate Studies in Europe. He has written 15 books and penned close to 400 articles 25. regarding religion and the trends towards that's alternative that's global that's futures. Join Professor Siebert now for his reflections on the critical theory of religion. That's what I just mentioned. Um, 
out of the Frankfurt School and so on. We, we started with these, um, with these first poetical attempts, which were quite impressive. I would say that um, the, um, sometimes people say that um, the Horkheimer became religious later in his life or so. Um, Horkheimer was from the very beginning, he was raised Jewish in Stuttgart and then um, uh, also yes, during, he was a member this of is the Horkheimer. Up to the end of this is Horkheimer, life. this is Adorno, so and Habermas was standing back here. And, uh, and he talked to Pollock, who was the, 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 the friend of Horkheimer. So here you have some core figures on there. Side and the modern enlightenment. Or concretely, they combined the Decalogue and the Second and the Third Commandment, namely not to make it's in Yugoslavia. Of the absolute, not to commit idolatry on one side, and on the other hand, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. It's the island of Kotor where they met before I founded my course in Dubrovnik. All these people met there, a little bit to the north. In Croatia, right? Huh? Uh, in Croatia, right? Kota, yeah, now Croatia, that's Yugoslavia. The island of Kota. How do you spell it? K-O-T-O-R. Well, see, 
Hegel in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of law. And uh, so even if one takes this, and uh, unfortunately, bourgeois scholars never go any further than to, to the other two, but even if one takes the, uh, uh, the first one, what is wrong with opium if people are suffering uh, cancer patients or whatever? Uh, so even that uh, betrays some, some uh, sensitivity for religion. It can help people to uh, mitigate their suffering, which they have. Um, the bad thing, of course, with uh, drugs is that they, people weaken or are weakened in their ability to transform the reality in such a way that it corresponds to their ability. Because happiness means that my ability and my possibilities outside are corresponding. If I have no possibilities and I have this tremendous potential, I would be unhappy. And vice versa, if I, I have these possibilities and I have no potential or whatever, that is also a very unhappy situation. And so uh, that is the disadvantage of all opiates, of course. And so in that sense, it is a critical thing that we have to see that Marx, first of all, didn't invent this, but he got it from Hegel. And Hegel had uh, 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 applied it only to Hinduism. So if Marx was justified now to apply that to all the world religions, what may have been true for Hinduism, and maybe not even for Hinduism adequately, that is a very serious scientific question now. But the definition of opiate is not an entirely negative one. Uh, if one, uh, no, what Marx has in mind is, you know, the suffering of the people under capitalism. But there were two other definitions, namely that religion is the heart of a heartless world and the outcry of the oppressed creature. <coughs> this sounds prophetic. And these two other uh, definitions have to be taken as seriously as the opiate one, and unfortunately bourgeois scholars uh, forget this all the time. So uh, then uh, I would say that the critical theory and uh, of religion as we have developed it further takes very seriously Karl Marx's uh, Christology, namely there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That is a very good uh, Christology from below and it would be much better in the discourse between Christians and Muslims and Jews if one would start with such a Christology from below, as it is called, instead of a Christology from That's above. That's right, Jesus the capitalists out of the temple. And the incarnation and so on, which may be very hard to, to understand uh, in a brotherly discourse with Jews and uh, Islamic <laughs> people. So uh, this issue, there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That would give the whole interpretation of the New Testament uh, another uh, another uh, uh, perspective. But then Christianity is no longer in coalition with the ruling classes, uh, with the corporate ruling class, but it is on the side of the poor, as they say. 
the same time, he also became a victim of um, the dialectic of enlightenment. So therefore, they, in a certain sense, uh, critically negated Freud, but also they preserved them and elevated in a certain way, wanted to fulfill the uh, great message of Freud. So that is the core problem of all the world religions, and we can just listen to that, and then we can question, they stop it. Important role for and then the we can listen to your questions. The very beginning. Ockheimer, Adorno, Fromm, and so on, they were all uh, Jewish people. They had a Jewish background. They grew up in, in Jewish uh, families. But as they grew up, um, before and during the First World War, they um, somehow became non-conformist believers. That means, to some extent, they preserved elements of their Jewish tradition, but others they had to reject. And so it was particularly the um, problem, the theology problem in Judaism and in other world religions, which seemed to them to be unresolved. And that was before Auschwitz uh, already. It was during the horror of the First World War with 10 million people dead. And then, of course, fascism and the horror of the uh, uh, Second World War with 60 million people dead, and, and then also Auschwitz and so on. Um, Judaism had only two really uh, the odyssey answers, and one of them uh, was that that uh, um, suffering, human suffering, was the result of uh, uh, personal sins or secret sins. And that is a very primitive and archaic type of the odyssey, which we find in other religions uh, as well. Antigone would say that is how we much, how we know how much we sin from how much we suffered, and so on. So we find it in Judaism, we find it also in Christianity and in Islam, and so on. So, um, but if we uh, compare this type of a theodicy, let's see, with an event like Auschwitz or Treblinka, uh, can we really say that God uh, um, punished these people for secret sins and that six million people were gassed because of their secret sins, and so on? What kind of a God would that be who would do something like this? And there was a second uh, um, theodicy in Judaism, namely that if we suffer, that this is a test. If we remain faithful, if suffering appears. So Job uh, is, um, is tempted by Satan. God allows Satan to tempt uh, 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 Job. And Job... Uh, um, has a good life, and Satan says, as long as he has a good life, it's easy to have faith. But if things get rough, and so if when he lost all his camels and all his his family and so on, would he still uh, uh, have faith? And so, on. so, and it shows in the end that Job really uh, um, somehow accomplished that test, and he remained faithful, and everything was restored in the end. But if we ask today uh, and and test this type of a this is the group the which bombed the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Compared to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who was tested there? Uh, uh, the pilot Tippett, who survived and still is alive today, or um, was it the pilot who committed suicide, or was it the pilot who joined the Trappist order, or was it the, the pilot who uh, ended up in an Air Force insane asylum because he all the small letters around the world that uh, such a crime should never be committed. And so, so, I mean, was it a test for the little uh, school children who at 8 o'clock in the morning on August 8th there were sitting in their uh, classrooms and took their breakfast out when the uh, bomb came down on a parachute and uh, uh, 
over here and said, yeah. yeah, they'd come, where are you? David, where did you go? Oh my God, this is your honorary place here. Like the Pope, when he was infallible, when he's infallible, he has to sit on his throne. See? You have to sit I'm, there. I'm about to that be is ordained. yours there. I'm about to be ordained. Oh, thank you so much. All right. I have to print. I have a lot of reading to do. I got to read chapters two and six. <laughs> I need to start them. Just take it easy, just slowly. Yes. Okay. Do yes. we have any questions about any words there, or what was expressed? So what we want to look for, we ha we look at these two scholars, right? But they are coming from somewhere, right? They are coming from a larger group. They are already the second and third generation, and so we penetrated to the origins to Hakama, Adorno, and Pollock, and and the second generation of Habermas, you see how young he is still there. He still has been there, he was, but he is not so young anymore. Uh, oh, thank you. So is there anything about, um, so Kant is mentioned right there. It says that one should not call them neo-Marxists or whatever. They could also be called neo-Kantians, or they could be called neo Schopenhauerians, or they could be called neo-Hegelians or so. So just to pick out Marx there, or Neo-Freudians or whatever, uh, is not entirely fair, because they supersede all of them. And there I have a concept now which we should ever keep in mind, negation. So they do negate them, they are critical, but there is a two negations. One is an abstract negation, where you say, this Hinduism is nonsense, it's all gone, we are not bothered about it anymore. Or where you are critical, but you know there are good things in Hinduism which you should not lose. And so the same way, there are certain things where Freud has become obsolete, but other things they should should be kept. The same thing is with Marx. The same thing is with Kant, or with Hegel, or whatever. Right. So this is dialectics. Dialectics is negation, and this negation can be either be abstract, and then you lose it all. You say this is nonsense. Or it is uh, this uh, uh, concrete negation. Then you are critical, but you say there are some things which Freud said which are still valid today, and some things which Marx said which are still valid today. When we had the financial catastrophe in 2008, where people lost their houses and pension funds and so on, a lot of German government people went back to the library <coughs> and read Marx's um, theory of crisis, crisis theory, and so on. So. That means uh, one doesn't have to throw it all out. Uh, one doesn't throw it all out when one sees, is there something which we should? And the same thing with the word religions too. Some of the things, you know, have become obsolete in Christianity, Judaism, and so on, and Islam. But are there other things, you know, which we have to preserve in order to remain human? So otherwise we would fall into barbarism. That means concrete and abstract negation. These are two concepts which are very important, which we don't have in our on, on the bourgeois side, on the positivistic side. So that we can keep in mind. Is there anything else in that what I said there? Which uh, Alex, do you have something on your tongue? I guess I'm wondering about the initial motivation to look into um, all of these different thinkers. Yeah. By What are materialists? 
We say a materialist is a guy who has just sex car and career. And so on. That's a materialist, wants money all the time. So. But there is a little bit more serious concept, and that means all people who think that there is something before nature, that nature is not only immediate, but that it is mediated. There you have another concept, dialectical concept, mediation or immediate. So nature is there immediate, but for these Jews and these Muslims and these Christians, it is not only immediate, but it is also mediated. It is created. It is posited by a spirit, by by a divinity, by a Godhead, and so on. While the materialist is somebody who starts with nature. Nature is priority, and there is nothing before nature. And that is true for pantheism in a certain sense, too, because God and pantheism are one. And that is why pantheism is sometimes also called atheism. People who think that pantheism doesn't have anything before nature, but God is nature, and there's nothing before that, they are also called atheists. So, and some people, you know, didn't want to call others atheists because it sounds so bad, and they called them pantheists. But, um, so, but this is another thing which we can keep up from the critical theory, from Lenin in that sense. Um, all religious people who have this presupposition that nature is not the first thing, but something secondary, that it is finite, that it is transitory, that it will end, and so on. They are idealists. All Christians, all Muslims, all Jews. On the other hand, people who say, no, we have to start with nature, that's all there is. If they say, we don't know anything, if there's anything before, then they're agnostics. So most of your teachers may not be atheists, where they say, I'm convinced that there is nothing before nature. There is nothing before the mechanics of nature, the time and the space, and so on. There is nothing before physics or chemistry. The bodies, the cosmic, the bodies, and so on, Big Bang included, you know, they, they would say Big Bang, there is nothing before Big Bang. Big Bang is it. Nature, uh, creatio, uh, is self-creation. It creates itself somehow. There's nothing before that. That would be a real materialist. Okay, so um, now if somebody wants to attack them, some people say they are not I idealists, you know, but um, I think for the time being, you know, it may be uh, it may be helpful to separate. And you have that also on your old map there, wherever it is. Um, uh, there, you see that on the old maps I made, is it getting too warm for you or is it okay? Is it getting too warm? We close the window there. Is it too warm? I'm fine. I'm just fine. Okay. okay. Uh, there, you see up there, that is the whole system of the critical theory. And up there you see a little arrow as if it was coming from somewhere. So um, if you take that little arrow away, you have a materialistic picture. Nothing before nature. But I put that there because I think they are still idealists, idealists around who think that nature is not the real starting point, but there is something, and uh, concretely that God's Word has created that. So the whole Logos thing, uh, that God through the Logos has created, like John chapter 1 there, and uh, the, the, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word, and then and the Word became fish. <laughs> and it became finite, it became man, and so the incarnation, and so on. So that would all be before there, before nature, and before man, there is something else. Let's call it something totally other or whatever. Either that is denied, and we are sure there is nothing before nature, as empiricists or rationalists or whatever, or we say, I have a certain method with which I can study sociology, or I can study chemistry, or I can study physics, etc. But with this methodology, as productive and fruitful as it is to discover and to split the atom and whatever, and to uh, discover new, always new Milky Ways, and so on and so on, it does not show uh, anything what was before there. I mean, we remain caught up in time and space, even if time and space bent uh, in, in a certain way or whatever, uh, was uh, was discovered in the 20th century and in, in, in this one. Um, it, we remain in this appearance world and we cannot go beyond it. That's what Kant, of course, uh, stated. 
And Kant did not deny that there was something before, but he said, all our categories, our language is finite, we cannot transcend our senses, there is something that we have to leave that to faith. But what the sciences can do is only to study, uh, study chemistry and physics and biology and so on and so on. It's all finite stuff. It's all relative, right? It, uh, you can see it with your senses, and then on the level of analytic understanding, you can apply uh, uh, means and purpose categories. You can you cannot see the means and purpose categories, right? That uh, Pablo and all these people had great problems with that, um, and then cause and effect and so on. So the understand, uh, analytic understanding puts that on these phenomena and thereby connects them and then also mathematizes them statistically and so on and so on. So, uh, but all that remains finite. And your agnostic teachers say there may be something out there. They may even go to church on Sunday and may say, I hope that this world of appearance is not the end of the whole thing. I hope there is more. The church, they talk like that all the time. They say, and there are the old people, and they say, is that all now? <laughs> and uh, so and then the religious people say, no, that's all. You know, more tentatively, um, the critical theorists would say, um, we are longing that this world of appearances, with all its horrible injustices, uh, will not be the last thing. So that's where they are coming from, right? So we have to take that into consideration. Uh, because why do they... Uh, protest, you know, against God, including Jesus, you know, the uh, Psalm 22, my God, why God, have, why have you forsaken me, you know, he doesn't say, I challenged those which, and therefore they murdered me, it's my own fault that I'm hanging here, you know, but he uh, blames God in a certain way, you know, why are you doing this to me? He preached the Heavenly Father, and the Father is loving, you know, and so on and so on, and now here he hangs and is tortured and so on. And all the gangsters are around him, the rich and the powerful, and uh, they have won, you know, and nothing happens, right? So Jesus does blame the, the God, you know, for, for what he is. At least at that moment, it is in Mark and, and it is in Matthew, so it appears twice, you know. And this t uh, thing is the Christian community never wiped it out because it sounds, you know, that it is such a desperate thing and that they were tempted, you know, to take that desperate thing out. The psalm, by the way, and Eric Fromm pointed that out in his book on the dogma of Christ, that the psalm ends more positive, positively. So Jesus had a heart attack. When you died on the cross, you had a heart attack. And when you have a heart attack, you cannot talk very much. So he just quoted the first verse, and well, there's a long psalm. And he ends, you know, with messianic hopefulness in the end. So he never came to the end. So... Eric Fromm would say, you know, any Christian theologian is so pessimistic about this whole thing. We don't have to be so pessimistic because everything in Judaism ends on a positive note in the end. So no matter how desperate psalms are, in the end the psalmist or the prophet ends with a positive note in order to console people. It will get better and, and so on. So, so now if we say, you know, why do they blame the God or whatever, um, then, of course, that comes from another direction. That comes from secularity. You know, that means the, uh, uh, there is no God. It would be atheism or agnosticism. We don't know a thing about it. And then people would say, blame yourself, you know. Uh, so even Hans Küng would say, God doesn't punish anybody. People punish themselves. So you do burden people then with a tremendous responsibility. And when you look into detail, you know, how guilty are they really? I mean, Hitler is a good example. I just, today I have to tell what my research is, and I would do a book on, on Hitler's The Odyssey, you know. Hitler saw the world. He was a soldier for four years. He was in the middle of this butchering where 10 million people killed themselves. And he came out and he said, look, I, I haven't done this. I haven't produced this, you know. This is not, he, he thought the nature was, uh, younger than shorter than he had thought about a few hundred thousand years or whatever but the Jews think six thousand years you know Hitler thought a few thousand years in the meantime we know that we may be you know, one and a half two million years old as human beings you know that the, the our universe as we know it now is 14 billion years old you know the earth here is about four billion years old and so is Venus you know and the first billion years the planet's 
called into each of them, into each of these planets, a planetary collision, you know. In both cases, Venus and we were changed, but we developed a magnetic field around us which protects our atmosphere, and Venus didn't. And look what it looked like, Venus, you know, no water, nothing. It was all sucked out because it was not protected. So, I mean, these are all, Hitler didn't even know, but <coughs> he grew up uh, in school, in high school. He had a religion course where they did um, um, creationism. And then he had a biology course, and there he learned uh, evolutionism. So these two things were standing side by side, and he didn't know how to connect it. Nobody told him how it is to be connected. So he connected it himself. And he deducted from what he saw in nature and history that everybody eats everybody, that God had created this, and that God is that God who creates predators and prey. And the whole nature is of just turn this thing on the nature channel on. Somebody eats somebody all the time, you know. And I just probably ate a little piece of a pig or a chicken or whatever, you know. So we continue our slaughterhouse. You know, everybody eats everybody. So, and he would say, you know, as a positivist, if there was a positivist, you know, that is what the world is like. And the God who has created that, he is on the side of the predators and not on the side of the prey. And he, he said, well, I'm not responsible for that. But I want to make sure that I am not the prey but that I'm the predator, and that my nation is the, not the prey, but the predator, and my race, the Europeans, you know. So that's why they still like him today. I have a movie about Hitler every year, and 20, 30 books written every year about him. So, um, because the, the, the white, so-called white man, you know, the Africans are growing, the Asians are growing, the Easterns are growing, they multiply like white mice, you know. And the birth rate goes down, you know, 2.1, uh, we have it after the pill was invented by the capitalists, and people were fed the pill, now it's 2.1%. Catholics, 2.1%, Muslims, 2.1%, everybody. Thinks. And on the other hand, the, the, uh, the other races are growing. So that is why he stays alive, you know, not only the con conflict in Jerusalem, you know, and uh, Palestine, you know, where people say, well, he said it, Hitler told us all the time, that's what they are. Why do you blame? You know, they break, they break all the, the conventions there and the, all the resolutions of the UN. Well, that's them. You know, he, he knew that, the parasites and so on. So that is why the fellow, the, the professor in, um, in uh, I think, there in Toronto, <coughs> um, the, um, what was his name there? Whatever. Um, he asked that the Jews would add a 604th uh, mitzvot. Fackenheim. Fackenheim, yeah, but for the Fackenheim, he left then, for, he went, left Toronto and went to, he died in, in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, so, 640 Smith vote, which said, <laughs> every Jew <laughs> should behave in such a way that he will not give Hitler a posthumous victory. Well, wherever the Jews, you know, bomb the Palestinians, they give Hitler a posthumous victory. So that is the, um, say that with great sadness, you know, because one shouldn't do that. But nevertheless, in order to know what Hitler's God was like, Hitler's God looked very much like the world which Hitler experienced in civil society, in bourgeois society, in capitalist society, the rich eat up the poor, exploit the poor, and so on. And so he said, I cannot change anything about this. So to be a positivist means it is the metaphysics of what is the case. That means I hold on to what is the case, the data, the facts, the numbers, and so on. That is what has happened in history. And in that sense, Hitler was a genius. He could remember when Hannibal crossed the, the, the Alps. He could remember when Napoleon, you know, went to Moscow. And when somebody said, you know, that's not a good omen, you know, you go on the 22nd of July uh, to Moscow. That's what Napoleon did. No, he said, he went a day earlier. He knew exactly the day when Napoleon attacked. So um, he knew the, the numbers, you know. He had three million men with which he attacked. Napoleon had only 900,000 and so on. So the people sometimes, after they had said something, they would go to the library and pick it up. They couldn't Google yet. Uh, and there, you know, it was exactly like it was. So a tremendous type, if, if a genius is somebody who has unbelievable uh, data available backward and then also in terms of predictions, so what he predicted 
what would happen to the British and so on. So, uh, so that is now, uh, there you have somebody who um, uh, still had some providence. He talked about the Albaiti or whatever, but he solved the thing of uh, the theodicy problem by saying, it's really your fault. If you make yourself into a predator, if you're strong enough, God will be on your side. If you are too weak for that, and you cannot shoot and hit and so on and so on, then God will be against you. And that explains why in the end, you know, he had no real regrets about the Germans. So he, uh, he expressed, and Goebbels to me saw very, very negative things about the Germans, because the German had had him as this great leadership, but they were too weak. They were too weak in 1917, and God punished them, and they were now again too weak in 1945, and therefore God punished them. See, so now, um, but the question is now, you know, um, when you look like a Hitler or Napoleon or whatever, to what extent, you know, can we say that these people are responsible for what they do? I mean, Hitler was a propaganda guy. If he had had not the whole military stuff, hundreds of generals and so on, you know, and hundreds of industrial people. Henry Ford was his friend, you know, Henry Ford was a fascist, and he paid him a new amount, you know, uh, and, and, and the industry and, and uh, IG Farben and Siemens and so on. They were all with him, so it was, so, but now all of them together, when you see their situation, you know, so they had lost the war, they had an unbelievable inflation, they had a depression at the same time, they had the Versailles dictate on top of it, they had the communists rising, you know, wanting to make a revolution, then they had the fascists. Now, to what extent, you know, are these necessary things, or to what extent can you make people responsible for them? So if you take the guard away completely, you know, not even the Hitler guard or whatever, um, then man is just alone, you know, with nature. But to what extent, you know, does the weather do things to him, to his nervous system, or in terms of external actions? Napoleon came to Moscow and there was this unbelievable snowstorm there. Dustin and I, we went to Moscow and we went to these airfields. Hitler came to these airfields when suddenly a winter struck, which they hadn't had for two decades and so on, you know. And, now, and, and nothing moved anymore, you know. The tanks didn't move anymore, the Stukas didn't move, everything froze, you know, and even broke, and was uh, beyond repair and so on. So to what extent, you know, are we so deeply rooted in nature that we must ask, you know, how free and therefore how responsible we are. So if we say, you know, uh, why do you have a theology? Well, why do you blame God or whatever? Blame yourself. But even if we blame ourselves, if you have a creator God, like the Jews and Muslims have, he is responsible. You cannot let him get away with things. That he created people who are so finite, the cursed finitude, they have to get old and sick and die and horrible illnesses and so on. No. I mean, you cannot blame human beings for all of that. And you will not, if, as long as you have this a priori, this God before nature, you know. Um, then you have to blame nature, you have to blame man. And, uh, but then neither of them created themselves. You have to blame the guy who did it all. And you cannot let him get away with it. See, the, so you have these alternatives, right? If you are an idealist, you have to bring God in. He is co-responsible for the whole thing. Because we didn't give us the shape of this body, that blood pressure, nothing. You know, that is all given. So we try to know this, and we just discovered the blood pressure, you know, in, in the 19th century or whatever. So slowly we discover who we are, but it is all given. It's all there already. We cannot be made responsible for all that what is there already. But we want to keep those alternatives open. So there's this idealistic alternative, and then you have to keep the God responsible. Even after you say you're sinful, you should have made uh, better choices, you know, and so on. So one doesn't have to deny um, it is some kind of uh, theologians call that synergism. It is uh, working together with providence and plan and purpose, and at the same time, man is free. The Muslims have that, the 
Jews have that, you know, they don't they don't overstate God's providence and governance in such a way that man has no freedom whatsoever anymore. Uh, Pelagianism means that you are tremendously free, you know, and God stays in the background. Theism the same way. You have it all, you have all responsibility. So they're all struggles with this, you know. But uh, people who are idealists um, will give man freedom <laughs> and responsibility and uh, there are things in nature which can go wrong but then the one who is ahead of nature and man must take his responsibility for having it created at all, you know. I mean, this is so messed up, this whole thing, you know. Even if you bring uh, the, the original sin in, and or the, even the radical Protestant sense, you know. Um, in the radical Protestant sense, see, the catastrophe of the original sin was so bad that our reason is completely uh, damaged. I mean, not only a little bit damaged, like the Catholics taught, it's totally corrupt. Uh, that means uh, Hitler, Luther would say, uh, the reason is a whore, you know. You can use it for everything. You can prove everything on both sides or whatever, you know. So, uh, and, so the, the, uh, and, and willpower, you know, Luther thought that even if one does something good, you know, to charity or whatever, how much selfishness is in charity? And is it not when you give somebody charity that you really make him feel that he's poor, that you enjoy your own superiority and so on? So if you put psychoanalytical things, you know, uh, on that, and, and Freud discovered all this, um, you know, how good are our good deeds really, you know? I told you that thing, I think, with this Jewish woman. So I thought I was doing a good thing, you know, I carried her suitcases there and uh, to the other, but what did I take the suitcases, you know, to the basement from which she was transported into the concentration camp. That means I, I delivered her to the to the executioners, you know, and it, it looked so good, you know, and because it was a good deed of the day, like a Boy Scout or whatever, you know, and it was all miserable. So um, it depends, but when you do, uh, you know, uh, the, the New Testament says that it's much harder to take than to than to give, you know, because as soon as you give something to a beggar there before the church or whatever, now he knows that he's really a beggar, you know, and though so he has a few cents more, you know, but what is this doing to him uh, to sit there, you know, and to play this role and so so. Nevertheless, that was a very good argument, Alex, to, um, to, and there are people who are inclined to that, and people who are atheists or agnostics, or they think, you know, that it is a weakness in man to um, find somebody who is responsible for it, and therefore say, well, you know, you just made the wrong choices, and so on. So, um, I, I think there can be a balanced thing, you know, for an idealist, and that is to, yes, I mean, you made the wrong choice, but you know, you were also in a miserable situation which was not of your own making, you know, and then you're biological, you're a living organism, you know, you inherited some stuff from your grandfather and son which you have to deal with, you can conquer it, but it's a handicap and, and all these things have to be figured in. But um, the uh, if you take the guard away, um, then the burden of guilt which is on people is enormous, you know. Who um, who was responsible for the ten million dead? Well, the Germans were responsible. Everybody knows that it was not only the Germans, you know. And six million people then dead in the Second World War. Who the Germans again? You know, the Japanese and so on. But we know, you know, that to burn people in their basements, in the hundreds of thousands of them, and to gas them in the, in the gas chambers, it's a very very different type of a thing. But in any case, they are dead. And in any case, they had no weapons. And they were victimized and so on. So um, that is, you know, you, you saw the bomber there. <laughs> there were 12 people, I think, of the bomber. And, and Tippett is the one who survived. And he feels good. He's, he's OK with it, you know. But one pilot committed suicide. He could not go on living. But that was what he had done, you know. And another one became a Trappist. I visited him in the Blue Ridge Mountain. A Trappist is a the strictest order thinkable, you're not allowed to speak anymore. You take a vow not to speak anymore. Oh, you will only have one book, that's the Bible, maybe another one that is Imitatio Christi, the two little books, that's all, no books anymore. 
and you meditate and you you know are with your tribes and you have to struggle and you negate yourself and, and so on and so on for a whole life long. That was the only way how he could deal with what he had done, you know. And the other one, uh, they said he became insane, but in reality he had conscience, problems of conscience. And therefore he said we must never do such a crime anymore. And he wrote letters around all over the place and they put him in the concentration camp. His guilt feelings thought it was not normal, you know, that this guy had these guilt feelings. <laughs> so he was psychologically damaged, you know. And he jumped out of the window once and started to write. I got letters from him in Germany. And then they put him there for good. And he died from cancer a few years ago. And so, so um, one sees, you know, that or take another example, you know, where guilt is loaded on people. Since the Vietnam War was lost, they were not received well who came back at home. There were no victory parties and so on. And the, uh, somehow um, the nation did not own the guilt which had been inflicted, all the villages which had been devastated and civilians being killed a mass and so on. There were only one or two trials, but it was massive what was done there. And uh, so then, since the nation did not declare itself for responsible, those soldiers individually began to feel responsible. And they were at home, and their wives said, uh, the feeling is not at home, even if he's at home. And then he went out hunting again, and it was not at home. Itself. And then 56,000 of them committed suicide. Like they are now committing suicide. That means the same number which fell in battle committed suicide at home. That is what, what it means when you have no release for guilt, when you have nobody else saying, I share that guilt with you. We sent you one million men over there. You didn't go voluntarily. We sent you there. We are responsible. We sent you there. And we misled you, and the uh, Westmoreland, you know, had the wrong plans, and you were beaten, you know. But we are, we are still our sons, and, and Obama, by the way, tries to do that now a little bit here and there. Late, 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 you know, but it's too late for many of them. So, so therefore, uh, uh, what we can say is, you know, if you have, if you are an idealist, then you will have this presupposition. And then you will share the responsibility. You would say, yes, Lord, we are guilty, and this your nature, there, and things go wrong all the time. But, uh, you know, you must take responsibility, too, for the curse of this finitude. It's not us alone. Now, when you are materialist, you cannot say that anymore. You know, you, all, you have nature now. You can curse nature, but nature is not aware. It's not conscious, you know. It doesn't respond. And so, so finally, it all falls back on you or the human species or this nation or that nation and you project your guilt on others, you know, even myself, you know, who are always criticizing the capitalists, how much of my own guilt do I project on these bastards, you know, all the time. So that I said, that you are responsible for this, you know, and so But in reality, if I would study it, you know, deeper, I would see that they are not so responsible as I thought. Because, you know, if you, <laughs> in 1980, we had a horrible depression, you know, and there was this, what was his name, President, um, the student center has its name. What is this? Uh, what is the student center called? Uh, the name of a Sanger. Sang. No, not Sanger. That's another guy. No. Another president. Bernard. 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 Yeah. Bernard was a Mormon and he was a very decent guy. But there was a depression. There was no money. They had to solve programs and so on. Everybody blamed him. They were all putting the guilt on him. You know. Now he wasn't guilty. We should have gone from him to the governor. You know. They said, the governor, why don't you give him revenue? But then the governor would say, I'm sorry, I don't make revenue. It comes from Detroit, from the ruling class, you know. And if you would then go to the ruling class, they would say, no, I'm sorry, you know, you know, the Germans, we bombed them out, but they uh, have new factories, you know. The Japanese, we bombed them out, they have a new factory, they're competing, you know. And uh, the unions push the prices up too high for labor, and we cannot compete, you know. So therefore we have to go outsource and, and so on and so on. So you would see that even the ruling class, you know, who have all the controls, they control the machinery, they control the press, the schools and everything. But how far are they responsible really, you know? Or how far are they not part of a system uh, which is of their own making, but nevertheless now as it is there, determines what they have to do. Um, they would say, you know, I, I know that if I uh, send in, in Flint, you know, I, I should all 15,000 workers out, they have their children in the schools. I don't want to do that, you know, but I have no 
choice, you know. We have pushed to push down the, the whole thing. You know, we have to get rid of this working force. We have to go south, you know, to Mississippi, where they get half of the pies, or to India, where the books were made there. <coughs> There's even tenth of the pies of here, and so And so, but all of that is that free decision now. Um, he could say, okay, I want to get bankrupt, you know. So you have that choice, you know. Either you obey the laws of the market, or you go under. Now, you can prefer to go under, but, you know, there is in us the will to survive. In our spirit, in our body, you know, want to survive. And people don't want to go under, and, and most people don't. So that, as far as this, this comes up very often, you know, um, don't push the guilt, feel respond, take responsibility, and so on. And there is some truth in that, you know. <coughs> and certainly all the idealists, they have to say, you know, to some extent people made a mess. The original sin thing, which many religions have, includes that man was responsible for the whole thing. Uh, the, uh, you know, but not really for the whole thing, but uh, nevertheless for some the things where paradise was there and, you know, trees were there, it was all very nice, and then they followed the snake and, you know, did this. So that shows that man's will has something to do with it. But I don't, I think it would be unfair to make people responsible for something which they did not create uh, and which puts them into all kinds of uh, uh, corners, pushes them into corners. Okay, is there anything else about this movie? About Freud, what we said about Freud, what we said about Marx, they are uh, important people and also Kant, you know, the, uh, the attempt of the critical theory is to connect Immanuel Kant with Moses. Moses forbids to make images of the Absolute and uh, to abuse names of the Absolute. And uh, Immanuel Kant does not allow us with analytical understanding to penetrate the realm of the thing in itself, of God, freedom, and immortality. These are infinite things, and we can only think finite things. So there is a similarity. So you bring both things together, secular enlightenment and religion at the same time. But that's not our main concern here. We want to see the broader thing, you know, the critical theory of society. We are sociologists, <coughs> not only uh, sociologists of religion. Um, <coughs> so is there anything else which you would like to, you know, which was a riddle to you? So um, the Odyssey is not only for <coughs> religious people now. Uh, it seems that way because Dios means God and DK means justice. So it is the justice of God in the face of the injustices of his word. So one should think if you are an atheist like Marx or Freud, you cannot have a theodicy. But they do have a theodicy. But the theodicy means something else. It is the study of suffering. What makes people suffer? So Freud then goes into early childhood child abuse or dreams or whatever, <coughs> experience with father and mother and so on, which some then are responsible for later neurosis and psychosis and so on. So that means um, these secular theodicies are an attempt to find the genesis of human suffering, as religion people did before. Think of the Gautama, right? The Gautama had was no sensitivity for theodicy whatsoever. He was nicely preserved, like many of our middle-class boys and girls and so on. He had never had an, a, 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 a theodicy experience, you know. No father died, no mother died, and, and whatever, everything went fine. So, but one night he went out and saw the old man and the dying man, the dead man, the sick man, and people weeping about them. So he was faced with a theodicy problem. Like the critical theorists in the first months of the war, then in 1914 and so on. And then what did he do? He left his wife, he left his child, and he went into the jungle, and he um, found out what the source of suffering is. All life is suffering. The will to life is the source of suffering. The will to life is what Freud later on, on Schopenhauer called the id. It is the instinctual apparatus in us. It is our libido, 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 not only genital sex, but libido in the broad sense of what we desire and wish and what we would like to ourselves to unite ourselves with. And on the other hand, the 
equation which we see so much, the killing and the murder, the killer instinct, etc. So uh, then uh, the Gautama invented a science, asceticism. <laughs> and asceticism means that you remove the images, the images of love and the image of aggression, the images of war and so on, and of money or whatever. You remove these images and you starve the will to life, to death. And then you are at peace. Then you look at your navel and you smile as the Buddha always smiles inside. So it is a form of self redemption, very different from Christianity. But the Christian idea of the cross to crucify the flesh or whatever has great similarities. And Schopenhauer brought together Buddhism and Christianity, form a form of the two. So. So the, that is when you have then the monasticism in the West and mysticism and asceticism <coughs> on the Mount Athos, you know, the Orthodox monks sit up there on the mountain, they have an elevator, nothing female comes in. No eggs, no cows, no milk, no women, nothing. Everything female is clo uh, closed up and uh, no images must reach the will to life, so it is put to sleep in a certain sense, it is killed off. Uh, the Gautama almost killed himself. He overdid it. He stood on one foot, hung himself up on a tree, he walked on fire and whatever. And these are all attempts of men to... Uh, um, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, you see the first chapter is body consciousness. You have to get rid of your body consciousness, you know. So um, if you know yourself, you, ha you are and you have a living organism, and then you have a consciousness and a subconsciousness and you have an intellect and a memory and a will and so on. This intellect and will now dictates no body consciousness anymore. On the other hand, you see a materialistic culture here. Look at the television there. First they show you food, you know, and then they show you a diet, how to get rid of the food. And then they show you the medicine when you get sick because you eat too much and so on. All the time it goes on. Food, 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 and so on. So, and these images, of course, people... You know, sit there and they see a schnitzel there and then automatically, like a sleepwalker, they go to the icebox and eat something and so on. So these images have to be removed in order to kill the will to life. And it's a, in a certain sense a horrible type of a process. But they have refined it, you know. Um, Zen Buddhism and I went to a temple there in Kyoto and stayed there some time. So they have made it more civil, the whole thing. But even to sit there, I was sitting there, you have to sit there and cross your legs and take the little sticks there and eat that stuff. They thought as a Westerner, as far as Westerners goes, I, I did the best I could. <laughs> it, was, it was awful, the toilets, I know, that was an Adam and Eve type of toilets like in Croatia, <laughs> but it was just unbelievable, you know. So, what they go through, you know, but, <laughs> but there, I, I found out, you know, that there were uh, Buddhist monks. I thought they lived in celibacy, but then they visited their wives over the weekend. So they make it somehow a little bit easier here and there for themselves. But <laughs> celibacy is, of course, a form of asceticism, and so it's fasting and, uh, and all kinds of things, you know. Um, today, the question is, you know, if in a new type of a religion, you know, humanistic religiology, if if it should really be ascetic or if it would not be better, you know, that love would be the criterion, um, as Eric Fromm and others would say, instead of, you know, somehow make yourself miserable, that the real criterion should be, you know, that you are a loving person and whatever sacrifice one would make, that you make it as a loving person and uh, not this concentration on killing off instincts or whatever. That the flatilati, you know, the guys who beat themselves up in the Middle Ages. There were times where they walked through the streets and they beat themselves bloody, you know, as they were. <laughs> and it can become pathological, the whole thing as well. But it must not be all the time. So we, we want to understand, you know, what, what this whole thing is about. So, <coughs> by the way, you know, even then Freud, you know, when he discovered the killer instinct, was very late. Um, he had the suspicion that man was a killer. <laughs> but only very late in his life he uh, wrote to a friend in Switzerland, a noble woman, he said, I, I try to deny it all the time, but I must say on the basis of my clinical experience, you know, there are people who don't want to live. And they don't want to go home, they want to die. You know, and Dr. Korg in here, he knew a lot about this, you know. And we, sometimes I'm called to the hospital, the Catholic hospital, and there are people, not only Catholics, but other Christians, and they want to commit suicide. They had it, you know. The doctors cannot help anymore with the pain, pain of no matter 
how much morphine they take, you know, it still hurts, and they say, I don't want to go home, I want to die, you know. By the way, uh, as far as hypocrisy is concerned, you know, Dr. Quarkin was the honest guy. They all, you know, can just give you a tiny little bit more morphine, it's called a shot, or whatever, give me a shot, you know, and they put a little cram more in, and you'll be dead, and so, so they, all, they all do it, anyway, so, <laughs> and uh, under, under, under cover, so, <laughs> and they were not entirely but critical against Dr. Quagian because behind Dr. Quagian there was the German experience. Uh, that means euthanasia. You know, the, uh, <laughs> when you start once to say, you know, some people's lives are not worthwhile living, and then who makes this decision, you know, and what is the criterion? In the capitalistic system, the criterion is can you produce surplus value or not? If you cannot produce surplus value anymore, you are very costly, you cost a lot, and you don't produce anything, that can be the criterion. Who should prevent anybody, you know? The, the Nazis had uh, other things, you know, like uh, participating in procreation of a healthy ways, and so So they started with the insane people, you know? And um, 100,000, 200,000, and they put air into their veins, and the bishop, old bishop of my diocese, discovered it in Hadamar, was the town where it happened, uh, and so he smelled it all the time from the crematoria there. He wrote a letter to the to the cultural minister, and for many years I thought the bishop's letter had made a difference, and they stopped it, but then I found out they didn't stop it. It just went on. So there was one category, you know, and um, after the war, I worked in a mine as a, as a miner. I worked in a car factory, then I worked in a miner. <coughs> and um, deep down, 800 uh, meters down, and I had a supervisor who was in charge of maybe 100 miners, and I lived in his house. And um, he had a daughter and had a son, and the son was 40 years old, but he behaved like a four-year-old one. He was huge, you know, but his sister could not get mad. She took it to the toilet, she dressed him, you know, he could not talk, but he obviously had emotions, you know, and the Nazis came uh, one day, and they said, look, it's a torture for him, he had these attacks, you know, they fell down, and uh, stuff came out of his mouth, and they had to lift him up again, and so on, so they said, look, it's a pain for him, you know, it's a pain for you old people, you know, and the girl wants to get married, and she cannot, because he has to deal with it then, so we come, in two weeks, we come, and we take him with us, and, you know, we put him down like a little dog and cat, and it would be very nice and peaceful and dignified, to a dignified death. But well, the old man, you know, said, if you come back, I'll be there with a gun. He did not do it. So he, um, I, I visited after t about ten years after that had happened, and the son was still there. Uh, the fellow and the sister was still so. <coughs> but that was, that was a clash very often between religious people who didn't want euthanasia and the others, the Nazis were delighted, people say it's useless, it costs a lot, and so on and so on. And they were not tyrannical or whatever, you know. They're, they're, they're people, usually when you see them in the movie, they seem to be so brutal. They were not always so brutal, you know. They were very friendly very often, you know. But then when the state decides, okay, they are not worthwhile living, then you have another group now, you know. They're, they're the gypsies. They don't want to use anything, you know, and then you gas them, and then there are the Jews, you know, the parasites, you, you get away with them, you know, and then there are communists, you know, who are a troublemaker all the time, you gas them, and there's no end to it. <laughs> and because people are afraid of that, that's why they put Dr. Quarkin into prison. They knew very well that Dr. Quarkin immediately, you know, when you stand at the bed there and see this person, you know, suffering day in and day out and through the night and so on and so on. Um, they all feel like Dr. Quarkian. And not only feel like him, they also do something about it. But so that nobody nobody notices it. You know, that's, that they know it about each other. <laughs> okay, so uh, do we have anything else about the movie? Uh, and as far as a short introduction was it? So if we get, you know, some kind of a of a view of the whole thing. So there are many scholars involved. The motivation, you ask, very important, you know. The motivation is that they had the Odyssey experiences, different from other people. And um, 
and the uh, it was not even Auschwitz. I mean, that came later, you know. But they were already the the, the Odyssey problem was when here when you have every week the flag goes down. It means every week a soldier in Afghanistan dies, young guy, twenty years old, whatever you know. Now we go on, you know, and we feel nothing, right? Uh, that is when you don't have the audio experience. But there are others like the Gautama and so on who feel that they are suddenly shocked by this. All life is suffering, you know. And then they have to find a response to that. Um, and that happened to the critical theorists. So they were identifying with the suffering, not only with the Jewish suffering, the suffering here on the other side of the railroad station. There are thousands of people whose humanity has no chance of evolution whatsoever. We console ourselves and say we are liberals and uh, they have the opportunity. Uh, everybody has the opportunity in this country, you know. But do they really have the opportunity? The black bourgeoisie is very small. Theoretically, everybody on the, f on the north side could pack his thing and go to university or whatever. Uh, and he would get some money somewhere or whatever, you know. But what is going on in him for generations, which puts him down and so on, but, you know, that, that the majority stays in the slums. Forty million people stay in the slums in spite of that op opportunity. So Obama got out of it, you know. But there were some factors there which got him beyond this. His father is running for office in Africa now, so there was something in the genome or something in the environment, you know, which made it possible. So, <laughs> so I think the main motivation is that they did have the Odyssey experiences and that this is also the reason why they became selective about their Judaism why they held on to Exodus some things, you know, and others and also in the New Testament uh, and also in Islam um, but uh, then also rejected a lot the God's anger, you know, uh, that he was angry and then he destroys people, he destroys children. Even if you were, uh, the cruelty of Yahweh, you know, is abominable. <coughs> Even if you think you have collective bargaining with Abraham and the angel, you know, if there are 50 just people in, in Sodom <coughs> and Gomorrah and the five cities, then will you save them? Uh, and then the messenger says, I uh, would say, what about 25? I don't know how low he goes, 10 maybe. And then if there are 10 just people there, uh, will you uh, will you save them, you know? Okay, he doesn't find just 10. You know, the, the guys want to sleep with those uh, uh, strangers there, came, came into town and they don't stop. And so the decision is made, they will now be <laughs> annihilated because they are guilty. Abraham says even, you are a God of justice. You don't want anybody to die unjustly, you know. What a wonderful argument, you know. In, in Islam, it is a little bit different. Islam, you cannot challenge the God. But in Judaism, he's challenged, you know. You are a God of justice. You don't want to kill them. But, well, then he killed them all. Five. Did you know that they were children in these cities? Because these homosexuals, they were heteros they were also heterosexuals. They all had families, lots daughters. You know, he had a lot of daughters. They were all married in town. He had only two daughters left who were virgins, whom he even offered to the crowd so that they wouldn't bother his uh, his uh, guests. <laughs> so, but what about the children? You know, there's not a word about the children. But that is the argument of the atheist and Paulus Karamazov, you know, where the engineer Karamazov says, you know, and if there is one child, you know, which has to suffer that way, I will give my entrance ticket to this damned creation back, you know, and then takes the only freedom which he thinks he really has and hangs himself. So Dostoevsky is one of the unbelievable psychologists, you know, and, and, and sociologists. The only thing why our psychologists and sociologists, our positivists, cannot uh, accept that is that they don't know how Dostoevsky or how Tolstoy or how Chekhov or Chekhov, how these people got to that result. That's all. There is no doubt, you know, that the Freud or whatever, or these great artists, that they had thousand times more knowledge than our guy behaviorists have. They, the behaviorists, will not deny that. But, you see, they, they cannot prove how they got
got it. You have an empiricist wants to see the Skinner box and the electrodes and the food on the other side, you know. You know, I went once with one of the former head of the department here. Yeah, we went and we liberated all the animals. Oh, always. They were, huh? oh, always. Always, yeah, yeah. always. Well, is he still alive? I, I hope so. so. No? I think so. I think he is. Is he? I think so, yeah. He started that commune. Yeah, had a commune. <coughs> and yeah, let me just tell you that you, you are yeah, so serious, <laughs> but it's a little bit funny about the whole thing. Um, Ulrich um, was the head of the department, the psychology department, and then he went home once to Mennonites. His parents and grandparents were Mennonites. So he went to the farm, and the mother said, Boy, what are you doing with your life? And he said, I am studying the connection with pain and anger. And she said, Well, your grandfather talked about that all the time. He knew about the connection. Why the hell do you have to study this? <laughs> so he came back, and he said, You know, why are we torturing all these rats or Pablo's dogs or whatever? When, when my grandfather knew it all already, you know, why do we have to repeat the whole damn thing all the time? So, and he uh, separated himself. I think he never could write an article again. All the behaviorist newspaper journals closed their doors, and uh, but he was too strong. He had brought too much money into the department because during the Vietnam War, the behaviorists were able to change a peaceful, uh, peaceful whatever teacher or whatever into an aggressive marine in six weeks, shorter than anybody else. And so they had so much money that once $10,000 got lost in the office and they didn't even notice it, and so rich they became. But um, nevertheless, the, uh, uh, he <laughs> then, uh, under Dieter Hennecke, who was such a nice man, Dieter, <laughs> under Hennecke, a student complained in the introduction to psychology. He said, our teacher, that's always said, we should go home and take a nap and see what happens to us. <laughs> and we fall asleep and then we wake up again. And then he said, go home and make a little birdhouse and see how the birds are really behaving. Don't put them into a cage, see how they really, that's what I do. I have a window here and a window in the back and I see what all the squirrels are doing. They do miserable things. It just destroys my whole cage out there. So uh, nevertheless, the Dieter Hennige then was horribly upset. The, student said, I paid, you know, for all these credits, and he sends me home to take a nap, you know. Is that what I paid for? <laughs> and then for a whole year, it went back and forth between Dieter Hennige and this older guy about his method and how important that was not to do this artificial thing. The rat in a Skinner box is not the rat anymore. You have to have the rat, you know, with an enemy, the rat with a sex partner, the rat with food, you know, and the rat being afraid or being aggressive and, and whatever, and you cannot see all that when you put them into the box. So, <coughs> nevertheless, one day we went to that building there. They have to, it's, it's near the, um, the Dieter Hennecke building there, and uh, they, they rebuilt it again. And then we opened up all the cages for the doves and for the little rats and so they were all running around all over the place and we opened the window, they jumped out of the window and flew away and so and then the police came. <laughs> they, they took us out there but they never charged us for anything somehow. And uh, Ulrich had quite some influence there. And he did this farm there so okay, the students, he took students into the farm and they could observe the horses running around freely and the little pigs and the sheep and everything how they are were in real nature. That was his idea, but, you know, his friends never followed him. Oh, there are strange ascetic types. One of them, he calls me up a lot, you know, and asked if we can, if he could use some of his asceticism without the metaphysics involved, you know, just the techniques or whatever. He has a little thing here on the arm, and whenever he has a nasty thought, then he pushes a button, and then the thorn goes into his flesh. That reminds him to be a nice guy. And so he conditions himself to be a nice guy. Uh, uh, it's quite a department, you know, and, and, and they're good people. I mean, everybody passes with them. They condition their students that everybody has an A and they're almost like me. Uh, I mean, can compete with each other. So, uh, uh, okay, so nevertheless, um, that was another story. Mm. So anything else about the movie? Then we make a break there, right, a little bit and eat some cookies. Um, you could oh. also put that thing on there. I'll vote for cookies. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So we can put.
put that little frog on there. Do you know how that works? How the little frog works? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Underneath okay. is a little button. Under the little frog. Under the frog? No, under the way he sits there. This lift the whole thing up. There. Hmm? The whole piece you lift right up that center yeah, piece. Yeah, this, up. yeah, this thing, yeah, there it is underneath. underneath. There, yeah. Oh, go feel around there, and you will feel it. Can you give it to me? I, I can. Look at it. That ticket for Saturday's game. Here it comes. Isn't that beautiful? Katya gave me that for Christmas. So Saturday's game. I think good. Does that make you feel good? Talk again. Little fog? I'm sorry. Oh, I was hoping we get Friday. I have a little fog outside. Yeah. Sitting I'll outside. be at all event on okay, Friday. Stand up, walk yeah. around, whatever. If you have the toilet up there, on the right side. Because, you know, when you have a dialectician on one side and you have a positivist on the other side, he wins. The dialectician wins, even if he has less weapons as well. Yeah. Because of the zigzag type of a method. I saw a map recently how Hitler moved, you know, when he came. The, the general who uh, moved into the airfields there in Moscow, he got a heart attack. So he had to be replaced, and um, Hitler took command then. So he pulled the um, troops away from Moscow and put it, put them down to uh, to the Ukraine, where we where we are, mm -hmm. the, you know, the capital of Ukraine. In Kiev? Kiev, yeah. And then um, he moved down to Stalingrad, but then he pull the troops away from Stalingrad too and send them to the Caucasus in order to get oil there. Right. Then he found the oil bill with the sources burning there, so he didn't pull them back. So in one case they all came too late to Moscow and the other case they all came too late to Stalingrad. So you see somebody who where the movement of the other confused him so much that he ran around from one way to the other and came always late again, because the dialectical method means you have a certain theory of what your enemy is, and so that you attack, you have casualties, you see the mistakes, and so you then factor them into your theory, and you change your theory. During that time, you are out of action, you withdraw. When you withdraw, the other side thinks, you know, we have won, you know. This, uh, that's what the general said there in Vietnam, we won, we won, and suddenly comes the Tet Offensive, you know. And then everything disappears again. And then they say, now we won, you know, and suddenly they're in the middle of Saigon. <coughs> it is this going back and transforming the theory, and with the new theory to uh, go into action again. From the action, uh, have experiences, and the experiences are factored in again, and you come again. So the theory is continually dynamic, and so is the action continually dynamic. That is devastating. For an enemy who was one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, you know, and straight, and, and so on. And you see, you know, when you see the troop movements which Hitler had, that he was utterly confused. He saw somebody and sent troops there, you know, and then the guy had disappeared again. And so the troops were stuck there, and nobody was there. So, But they were suddenly on another side, and, and this. Mm -hmm. so it's not start balancing back and forth or whatever. It's a progressive type of a movement in contradictions. That's what it is. And I don't know why our universities, you know, have not do not moved to that. We had it up to the twenties, to the Great Depression, and then uh, we gave it up because we thought if people think that way, they become revolutionaries, they become destabilized. You know, to stabilize people, we put that uh, the positivistic stuff on them. The religion department everywhere. It's devastating, but the reason, the motivation, why we don't want to have dialectical thinking. I just tried that again. I give public talks in February, and I use these words Hegel and Marx and, and Freud. And they asked me, Do you have to do this? Please don't mention those people. And so, I mean, there's the greatest thinkers of modernity, you know, dialectician, who invented a new logic after Aristotle, the first one. And, and they just ignore it, you know, and fall back. Not only behind Hegel, they all are back behind Kant. In our history, uh, philosophy department, they did not even. Uh, teach Kant. There was a guy who wo worked in the post office and they hired him to talk a little bit about Kant. You know. They told me Hegel was persona non grata. Yeah, yeah. right, that's what in he the called philosophy it. department. Yeah. Or they say yeah. he's too difficult, yeah, right. you know. If they are honest, they say, you know, we should study him. We should study him, but he's so difficult, you know, and it takes a lifetime to study the phenomenology of the spirit and so they don't do it at all. 
But if you don't work yourself through somebody, he will always fall into your back again. You know, you have to do that hard work to get through in order to get come out on the other side and finally undo the guy, you know. One should not get stuck with a great thinker there. But people are cursed to write commentaries on Plato, on Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas for generation and generation, Augustine, you know. Uh, so there is a great thinker and then they write commentaries. I mean, we're still writing commentaries on, on Hegel, you know. It's not very desirable, but the Marxists, you know, uh, from idealism to materialism, but they have not been able to create a materialistic logic. Lenin commentated, you know, the logic all over the place, but he doesn't come up with a new one. The uh, Adorno and Horkheimer had this uh, Dialectics of Enlightenment that was supposed to be a new uh, materialistic logic, and they were not able to do it. And our decision is to fall back behind the form. This backwardness is very dangerous. Who was that guy, the leaves of grass there, the great American poet? He said, uh, you know, a great nation needs a great thinker, and Hegel is that great thinker. You know. And they didn't listen to him. And, uh, but the, and the same thing in religion, too. You know, they, both uh, Protestant and Catholics are in a miserable type of situation. A crisis like, you know, in the 13th century or so. And Thomas Aquinas got them out at that time. <laughs> you know, Hegel could, and Karl Barth said this, Hegel could have become the Thomas Aquinas for the Protestants, and I would add also for the Catholics. Now then, this I mean, when you see these television stations there, these religious things, I mean, it's so abominable that one can, you know, if, if youth are not attracted to that, it's, it's quite understandable, you know, it's just below all things. The Catholic, the Catholic television thing there, but there are many Protestant ones, you know, the theology, the substance in is just abominable. <coughs> but, you know, you can only tell them and they listen or not listen. <coughs> okay, are we ready again? We have just a few minutes left there, 20 minutes. Um, so let me just uh, get to some of the rules here for a moment. We don't want to overburden us anymore. <coughs> Let's look at this here. So our first um, uh, first discourse there was about the structure and the history and the consequence of the critical theory of society. So you have on B here, you have the whole structure of this um, of the critical theory, not of religion, but the critical theory as, as such. Um, so when we start out with this nature up there, this L, uh, what do we say? Do we say that they are atheists? That would not fit really. really. Um, their definition of religion is that religion is the longing for the totally other. Religion is the longing for perfect justice. Religion is the longing for unconditional love. Religion is the longing that the murderer shall ultimately not triumph over the innocent victim. That means there is not knowledge, but there is a longing that there may be something that le uh, something else than the world of nature and history with all its cruelty and so on. So in that sense, we cannot really call them atheists. As long as somebody is longing beyond the world of appearances, that means nature and history, um, they are something else, whatever we call that. Um, because that hour there, they may be something. And it's not only a postulate, so we saw that with Kant there. Um, Kant would say we cannot prove the existence of God. Um, our uh, analytical understanding cannot transcend the senses, so therefore Kant destroyed all the proofs of God, all the metaphysical proofs of God, the cosmological proof, the teleological proof, and the ontological proof, um, and always with the same reason, because in all of them, people go beyond the world of appearance, and we cannot do that. Our categories are finite, this is the infinite world, we cannot go there. So, um, But Kant still said, we must postulate that there is a God and that there is free will uh, and that there is um, immortality because otherwise we cannot live a more life. <laughs> so in other words, when you see Bush and all these people getting away with, uh, with this murder 
Bush murdered one million people in Iraq and 10,000 in Afghanistan and so including our own uh, in, included in all of this and so and he gets away he just sits down there with his life away you know and has a good time and the medical doctors take care of him and so so if, if that goes through you know in the masses of the people that there is no judgment day you know there is no the, the nation doesn't have the guts to put them on trial push in its old cabinet and for, or to send them to Den Haag for two war crimes to uh, initiate two wars um, that uh, uh, you know so they get away with it and that undermines all morality and if you have contemporary issues I think we did it the last time already and we think of that 21 year old guy there with a psychosis killing his mother and killing the 20 or whatever people um, he grew up you know during the war of terror that means daily did he um, hear about what happened in Afghanistan and so on. Um, and, and all of those people who do the murdering and so on. That plays a role what the state is doing. Uh, we are killing maybe 250 people a month now with their drones and so on. And there is no international law justification for that whatsoever. And this is reflected in the movies. This movie, How They Killed Bin Laden, for instance. And and that is reflected also in the video games, you know, where you can participate in the shooting and so on. You can even practice it. So, I mean, that's the cultural and the social environment and the psychosis, you know, psychosis which may come from the Oedipus uh, complex, <coughs> that he loved his mother. He was glad that the father had gone. He had no contact with him anymore. And, uh, but now the mother may get lost. She didn't come back for three weeks. She was in the spa or whatever. And so the psychosis and connected with that what's going on in society and what is reflected in the culture and so on gives the sufficient reasons why why such things happen with necessity again and again so that we can predict yes they will happen again next month or two months from now. <laughs> okay, so that is the first thing there. They are not atheists. Uh, to what extent Marx is an atheist is, is very much of a question. Um, sociologically, yet, yes. But sociologically, Marx and Horkheimer and so on, they were attacking bad religion. And where did they know what bad religion is? They knew it from Kant. Kant wrote a piece on religion in the boundaries of analytical understanding. And um, there he talks about opiate religion. That's where the opiate of Marx comes from. It's not genuine, not from him. It's not even from Hegel. Both of them got it from Immanuel Kant. And uh, Kant talks about a situation where somebody's dying. <laughs> and when somebody's dying, they call the minister in, the imam or the rabbi. And then they're going to be consoled. You know, everything's all right. Christ is your savior. And, so on. <coughs> and Marx thought that uh, consoling religion, which at the same time dulls the conscience, so that you can live here in Kalamazoo side by side of what is on the other side of the railroad station and you are not moved at all, you have no uh, theodicy experience whatsoever that's what bad religion does and our formula is Christ is your savior don't worry and so on Ma uh, Kant thought that the minister should console, he wasn't against consoling but he was against the dulling of conscience so the minister should say is there anything in the last moment of your life which you can still straighten out, you know. Uh, or is there anything which you can still repent and make good in the last hours and so on? So to sharpen the conscience. So the religion which consoles and sharpens the conscience is good religion. A religion which only consoles without sharpening the conscience, that's opiate religion. And there is a lot of opiate religion around. Just turn the television on, you know. It's all about consoling, you know. Not a word about Iraq, not a word about Afghanistan. Nobody, I mean, they would lose all the members probably if they would do it really, you know. But wouldn't it be the task of a church and say, you know, we're believers, we're all taxpayers, we paid for this whole thing, you know. We murdered all these people and, uh, you know, that cannot go well, let's repent it or let's make something good, what we can make good and so on. But I don't know any church which does that, you know, and there may be one, tell me, you know. <laughs> okay, now, but I want to zero in on something here, and that's under human subjectivity. 
that's where the critical theory uh, starts, and particularly with Habermas, and uh, wh where are they located? So when you look at human subjectivity, you have the anthropological level. Um, so uh, the man is, of course, an organism, so according to them, right? So that means the living organism, he has evolved from the animal kingdoms and so on, so in that sense they have learned from Darwin, so has Marx, and so has Freud, and so on, so they all this Darwinian thing. So we have an organism, we have a body, and, and so on. But then they follow, you know, the Knoti Theauton of uh, the god Apollo in Delphi. That was his great command to everybody, know yourself. And that meant that man knew himself as that animal organism, but at the same time he knew that he was more than this animal organism. That means that he had a consciousness, and since 200,000 years, we have a self-consciousness. That means when we look in the river, we know that's us who looks in the river. Your little dog, when he looks in the river, he does not know that he is this dog. So since 200,000 years, we do not only have a consciousness like the animals have too, but we have also a self-consciousness. From then on, we also have religion and art and, and so on. So people always write to me now online, you know, and then I have this little ducks and otter, you know, and so I said, I'm so happy that you have a little dex dax hund and uh, love him, you have a friend, but the poor little guy cannot think, and because he cannot think, he doesn't have religion. So there's something missing in him, but love him anyway, he feels, he has feelings, and because he has feelings, therefore he can be your friend. <laughs> so, but it must be disappointing, you know, that the poor guy cannot think, and therefore has no religion. So, nevertheless, that the anthropological level means <laughs> that we are, uh, uh, we are, men and women, we are young or old, uh, we are healthy p physically or mentally or not, um, we belong to this generation, we belong to this race, we belong to this nation and so on. That constitutes the anthropological level of our, um, of our thing. Now they are liberal minded, so they are very skeptical of course about an anthropology of race and so much abuse has taken care of, you know, has happened to that. But I don't think we should let ourselves be pushed, you know, by the ideological abuses, particularly of fascists in England and France and Germany, to say that there is no race or whatever. I mean, we do have different races. And I'm happy about Obama, because Obama is half at least different from us. He has abilities, and I admire him for this, you know which you would not find in white, so-called white people or so. So I think uh, there is a racial personality, there's a racial body, but I think it's also a personality, and not only how he speaks and so on. He can say things which no fully white man can say or would say. And I think it's wonderful, you know, and so we always when we have this rebellion to the black people in our uh, cafeteria and so on, you know, I went to the north side and I gave speeches to them and I had all this guys are surrounding me to protect me from whatever was there was a dangerous uh, of, a, of, a, of a situation so, but people are different and there is nothing wrong with this difference what, is, what went wrong with the Nazi anthropology was that they hierarchized the races and said this, this Aryan race you know they invented everything they invented the car Henry Ford and the airplane the White Brothers and, and so on and so on you know and <laughs> the Japanese, you know, they could not even ride bicycles if there was not Germanic tribesmen had landed there before. And then the Indians, you know, if they, the Norway guy had not marched down there 2,000 years before Christ, and so, then they would, couldn't have done anything. So that means uh, this is, of course, I mean, it's idiotic, it's sick, it's stupid, and so on. But they really believe that, you know, they believe that the ancestors were in the Caucasus and Hitler gave an order, you know, that they should be treated particularly well in the Caucasus because he thought they were the answers, but they were not really white. <laughs> they went to India, too, and uh, had all kinds of contact as, as, as doctors. I mean, they had a doctor degree in anthropology or whatever. They were sent everywhere to find all these answers. And so so <laughs> I'm, I mean, the, the, uh, I think where it gets really wrong is that one race thinks it's superior and has a, a right to colon colonize other people and make them into slaves or think they're slaves by nature and whatever. That's where it's really furious and where it becomes poisonous, you know, the whole thing. But that should, does not mean that there is not an anthropology of race and that the, the races are different and that, you know, when I, when I went to the side over the north side, you know, black is beautiful. <laughs> yes, black is beautiful, of course. And not only for the black,
the anthropological. Then comes the phenomenological level, you know. So uh, the Adorno and and Horkheimer were phenomenologists to some extent. So they uh, visited Husserl. Husserl was a great phenomenologist. <coughs> Husserl's uh, uh, lectures, you know, and they went to Heidegger. Heidegger was a student of Husserl. So that is uh, the whole phenomenological tradition. In New York, there is a new school university that is based on phenomenology, and they were the great competitors of the Frankfurt School people who were in the other in the other university there. So one, uh, so but uh, the uh, the there is some cookie side to it. Uh, the Nazis always thought that Hitler was the great phenomenologist, and uh, he was greater than the others because he knew the kairos. It was a biblical concept which Tillich had used and which uh, Tillich was angry that the Nazis used it too. The right kairos, the right moment. Hitler was a phenomenologist who knew the right moment to act. In that sense, he was particularly superior and so on. So mm -hmm. then uh, um, theologians who worked with uh, Nazism or uh, uh, did not really fight it. Uh, Romano Guardini was my teacher and he had this phenomenology very strongly. And otherwise, my doctor father was lots, and he was a fascist, and he had that too, to some extent. So he was more of a historian. So um, it, uh, it, uh, phenomenology was seen as uh, Eliade, you know, as a, as a fascist and a phen phenomenologist too, to uh, to see those phenomena like priesthood and uh, and uh, sacrifice or whatever, and then see it in different religions and collect the meanings in each religion and then you have a notion of phenomena and an archetype of sacrifice or what which is much richer than any sacrifice which Hindus or Greeks or Christians or whatever may have so that is phenomenology and uh, but they left it behind there so I don't know wrote against Husserl and, and Heidegger became the arch enemy of, uh, of uh, Adorno who ended every speech which he gave and it says so huh. sensio cataginem. Instead of that, he said Heidegger uh, denendum esse. That means, uh, in in general, I think that Heidegger has to be destroyed. And <laughs> there was one, one time they met in Münster with Kogon and Dirksen, and then Kogon said in the end, "Now, dear colleague Adorno, could you maybe <laughs> end in another way?" And Adorno said, "Well, I'll try." <laughs> so. It was the only speech I think he ended without cursing. Uh, I, think <laughs> it, so, uh, yeah. I didn't so never responded to him either. No, never, not no, even for no, the majority of us. He was in the Black Forest. He couldn't scare less. Was a little Jew there. Hannah Arendt was the lover of um, of Heidegger. And there you see the inconsequence. Hannah Arendt was as Jewish as you could get when you see her with a. A cigarette in her mouth, you know, she <laughs> is absolutely Jewish. I mean, there is nothing un Jewish in her faith. She was also the cousin of Benjamin, of Walter Benjamin, who also looked as, as Jewish as you can possibly look. <coughs> oh, by the way, I don't say this now in a, from outside because my mother was always considered to be Jewish. She looked Jewish. And my daughter Maria looks Jewish. And my uncle Adolf looked Jewish. And uh, <coughs> But they came from a Farmer family in Hessen, and nobody could prove that there was a Jew sitting in the tree. On the other side, uh, the Siebert family, they were judges and college teachers, and uh, my uncle, the judge, he had all the papers of the family, so he traced it back to the 1500 and proved that there was not one Jew sitting anywhere, that we were absolutely <laughs> pure. But then, um, after the war, I thought, why do they look so Jewish? And I <laughs> took my brother and um, who did not like Jewish people so and I went from one village to the other and traced my mother's ancestors back which was all dark there so I went from one Protestant thing because before 1880 you don't have any state registration the only way where people are registered is in the church so I went from one pastor to the other looked through these big volumes and so on and looked for the family and there 1725 a little Jew creeped into the village and there was my ancestor there, a woman with five children and her husband had forsaken her and he crawled into her bed and there was this little thing came up which is the beginning of my grandmother's and this little, now the, if that had been discovered in the Nazi time um, it 
would not even have been too bad because it is about seven generations the Semitic uh, gene from the genome is supposed to disappear. But obviously, my daughter Maria says that's more than seven generations and it's still there. It's a very tough type of a gene. <laughs> and uh, I always tell her how good that is. But uh, nevertheless, my brother was sitting outside and he had the car and I said, Carl, we found it. I found it. I found the Jew in our family. We have a Jew. That's why we are so smart, because we have a Jew. <laughs> and the <laughs> poor guy got all white in his face, and so he never forgave me this discovery. He said, we should never have gone there. And then he said, well, years after years, he said, we should go there again. Maybe you made a mistake. <laughs> I said, no, no mistake. He says, no, that's how he came from. But he was already half Jewish, but his mother was Jewish. <laughs> and that's what counts. So he was Jewish. No way to deny it. So, <laughs> therefore, I can, I can, you know, maybe we. I, I really love Jewish people. I mean, they are when they are good, they are really good and they're amazing. When they're bad, they are worse <laughs> than everybody else. <laughs> so, but you know, the good ones, I really like the good ones. So, <coughs> nevertheless, that's the same. And, and I have, you know, unbelievable compassion. I, but the faiths which I have, uh, I don't know if I told you that in the prison camp. Norfolk, you know, Katya feeds me the same way like I'm fed there. It's <laughs> under 2,000 calories, I think. <laughs> I was reminded of this all the time. So, nevertheless, there was, when I came to the camp, there was um, Stau Stauffenbergs, um, Colonel Stauffenbergs, von Stauffenbergs, who assassinated assassin, Hitler. His cousin was there, and he greeted me when I came in. So, I had my shirt, was in Marseille, and <laughs> I had almost no clothing on, so I came there and I greeted him and he said, why are you here? I said, why I'm here? I said, Do you know, Germany is finished. Not finished, not finished. He said, everything is bombed out. No, no, no cities. Enemy propaganda. That's right. He had a cross hanging there, so he was highly decorated. And they were all from the Africa Corps. And they walked around with the Africa Corps thing and they were arch Nazis. They thought everything about Germany, the reports were all lies. <laughs> the first night, uh, he said, you know, why, why did you defend it? I said, where, where, where were you? No, it was in Africa. I said, well, good place to be. <laughs> and they were beaten there, so should have been at home. So uh, as we had a little, then I went to bed, and then in the night, suddenly alarm, uh, they had sentenced somebody in the name of Hitler because he had talked with a Jew outside the camp, sentenced him to death and put him into a toilet and suffocated him there. And then the, the uh, military police came in and they got the guy who was dead and found nobody who had done it, you know, nothing. So, I mean, they were a tight Nazi community in these camps and they were well fed. The United States honored the, the, the Geneva Agreement even after there was no German government anymore. Well, the, the food went down a little bit then, but <laughs> still <laughs> more than they had in Germany. So, you know, so and, there, and then they were here in cross hearings without torture. I tell it all the time. You know, when they think now they have to torture all the time in order to get something, they were smarter, you know. So they were all FBI, the predecessors of the FBI. So they were all Jews. They all spoke German better than I did. And they knew exactly what we did in Frankfurt, the Catholic Youth Movement, and uh, Bishop Garn, who sent those letters around about con against concentration camp, also against bombing. Um, the Allies and uh, and we distributed that and so they knew that better than I knew and so I was categorized as anti-Nazi there and others were categorized as Nazis and I had a guy you know on how they did this was they had a guy in my room there were little houses there in which we were and he um, they said you know what did you do you were in this unit you know you were a truck driver right and then you unit, you know, we know where you were. You were in Lemberg, you know, in Poland there, and Christmas, and then so and so, and yeah, you were there, you yeah. What did you do? I drove a truck. What did you drive a truck? Where did you drive the truck there? Well, I drove the truck there in the countryside. Ah, oh, countryside. Who was on the truck, you know? And so they put the network closer and closer and closer until they, he had 60 Jews on the truck, and he drove them to, to a stone thing there, and they were shut and put in. So then he would be characterized as not only as Nazi, but as war criminal as well. And they were sent then to England and to France to work in mines, which was against the Geneva Convention, by the way. And then also to um, France to clean up the Normandy from bombs, from, from uh, things there, the, what, what is it, uh, the ground, which he put in the ground there. Mines. Mines, and they lost.
off the map, you know, and nobody knew where they were, and you had to go with the stick, and boy, it blew up, and your hand was gone, or your leg, or whatever. So I was there, I was put into an SS camp, and for three weeks, you know, they had me there because I had a wrong number. So when they sent the anti Nazis to the concentration camp, the American concentration camp, and the Nazis they sent to Hamburg, so they just mixed up. The Liberty ships had no names, they had only numbers, and so they mixed up the numbers. So they also went only five times. If you were the fifth trip, you know, that was a very risky type of thing. You could not make it. So, <laughs> nevertheless, there, there was somebody in this camp now, a Jew, and uh, he was an officer. And he was with these with these uh, people there, the intelligence people. And um, uh, I was an officer. I didn't have to work, but I volunteered anyway because I didn't want to sit there in the camp. So I went out, and uh, I had a little. Yes, first I, I I worked in a in a restaurant where the GIs came with their girlfriends from the movie, and I had to fry hamburgers. So I fried hamburgers, and then I was tithing. Every tenth hamburger I put into my pockets there and took them home because the, the calories had gone down a little bit. So, and then I had my pockets full. It was these marine trousers, and so and then took them home. And that went on, you know, for a few weeks. And then once, when I put the hamburger in there, the owner found out that the hamburger disappeared, and I was fired. I was right away fired. So, then I drove a truck from boxes, from the train cars to the ships, or from the ships to the train cars and so on. And there, <coughs> I let every tenth box fall. That was, whatever fell belonged to the prisoners. So I, and I have still a wound here on my finger because it fell on my finger. This was a little mistake that which I made. But every tenth box fell down and then gloves came out and shirts and, <laughs> and I distributed that in the camp. So, But then finally, that Jewish officer, he somehow <laughs> thought that something could become of me, and so he took me home, and I was in the library, so I could now read and give books out, and and then the, I got into a camp without barbed wire, and I was trained, uh, educated, or whatever, from my Harvard professors and others to uh, go back to Germany, because in the Roosevelt cabinet, there were some people like Morgenthau, who thought all Germans were evil, they had to be castrated, and the whole thing should be an agricultural territory. But then they were counter foreign force, Mrs. Roosevelt and so on, and they decided, and Kogon and Dirks and Horkheimer, they were all there, and they worked with Mrs. Roosevelt, and they established an educational program, and this Jewish guy put me there. And then, when I was here in the 80s, uh, somebody, uh, they wrote something, an encore thing, there. You, you know it, you have my picture on it, and there was a guy in, in the dentist's office in Detroit, and he read this. And he said, this is the guy. And he came and called me up and said, I am the officer who put you into the library. And uh, I'm not entirely sure if he was, because, you know, in the meantime, everybody had changed. And, but he was convinced that he did that. We became good friends. He was a salesman for sweaters. He sold sweaters everywhere. And he lived in the Jewish section of Chicago, a very rich guy in the meantime. And then he died from a heart attack, and his wife uh, called me up for it. So that's just uh, some how, how things happen. Well, back to the uh, to the uh, so anthropological thing that would include the whole race thing, and so we shouldn't uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. So I think there is an anthropology of race and, and of sex and, and so on. But uh, the phenomenological thing that's important. We close up with this uh, because um, these these. Uh, evolutionary universals they are called uh, uh, or human potentials or hum these five there so that's language and memory work and tool, sex and eroticism struggle for recognition and nationhood so um, that constitutes our humanity if we would lose one of them we wouldn't be anymore what we, what we are So uh, and now there are two of them Language and memory, Habermas took out <coughs> because Marx emphasized work and tool. So did Adam Smith, right? So work and tool. The critical theorists, the older generation before Habermas, um, also emphasized this human potential of work and tool. And then Habermas shifted to language and memory, and he shifted to the struggle for recognition. 
and it is connected with these two things that we have this uh, um, issue of the uh, pathology of reason pathology of reason pathology has something with the struggle for recognition or the issue of uh, uh, looking down on people the opposite of recognition the um, what would that be in English the opposite of recognition non-recognition you are nothing and, and so on so disrespect disrespect of it yeah, respect is another thing disrespect yeah so it is there where the core of this uh, issue of pathology of reason is concerned um, or um, being torn apart being torn asunder um, in, in a threefold way namely in relationship to myself in relationship to others and relationship to nature the ecology thing so um, that means this torn of thunder is the opposite of reconciliation and so what the capitalistic world is doing to us it prevents this reconciliation it uh, enforces this disunion this alienation of man from himself uh, from man and the other human being uh, in this uh, system of at atomism as Hegel called that the civil society it's atomized, it's narcissistic so people are estranged from themselves, estranged from the others, and estranged from nature. And then the task of therapy is how one can reconcile, how one can overcome these three forms of alienation. Okay, so it is in these human potentials there uh, where we can see what has happened. That means um, Hegel did this and Kant, and so Habermas went back behind Hegel before Hegel made a system out of this and started with language and the struggle for recognition and was thereby to, able to bypass Hegel and to bypass Marx as well and, but also there is this negative thing now where people say you don't say anything about class anymore you don't say anything about surplus value anymore and so on uh, you become peaceful that means uh, Habermas would say the class struggle is not a way out let's talk with each other you know so the classes should talk about the rich classes and the poor class. But you see, the producers of guns, for instance, it's very hard to talk with them. You know, the president has a hard target to Congress and so on. Uh, they, because when you have the class differences, you can have a debate and shouting and screaming. But can you really have a discourse with class antagonists? You know, but this is where the blue-eyed optimism comes in, which the, to the left of our mouth and and uh, Hannes there, people would say, you know, this is, uh, this is too really peaceful, you know, we all want to have harmony, but you have to get to it, you know, you have to uh, achieve it, and how do you do this, and can you really have that by town hall meetings, you know, and see, Obama has that, you know, he promised he would talk with, to the Iranians, you know, but then it has become difficult to talk to the Iranians, obviously for Obama too, a lot of his willingness to talk with them and, and the others on the right they think that is already a sign of weakness you know if you want to talk to people and he went to Egypt you know Obama and he apologized for the bad things the Americans may have done and so on. that's right away a weakness for the right to then attack him for, for doing that and humiliating our nation and not being patriotic and being a socialist and not being from here and not having the birth, uh, birth like it and, and whatever so um, one sees how, how poisonous all these things can get. But it is this, the pathology of reason has something to do with this being torn apart in the struggle for recognition and not being able to talk to each other anymore. We have that in marriages, you know, and in, in, in families already, you know, but also among the classes and then among the nations as well. Okay, so that may be all for the day. Um, we want to close punctually and we will get more the next time. Just that you know where in this whole scheme there, where we have to zero in. We have to zero in on human subjectivity and from then on we can also go into civil society or the constitution state or history or whatever. But the, uh, the point where the earthquake is really concentrating is here in the human subjectivity thing. Okay, thank you for coming. You all get a wonderful A.